Uh, just a quick introduction to the trailer. Uh, this was something that came about uh, wondering what we could do for our OEM customers that would show them in one brief meeting everything that we have for control. So what we did was put this trailer together with the flavor of OEMs in mind. And OEMs can be equipment builders or they can be panel builders. Um, they're interested in anything from IEC to NEMA. We've got uh, all the products on this trailer that those types of customers are interested in. So specifically, you'll see items on this trailer that, uh, for instance, we talk about the drives later on, um, you won't see an SVX, and there's a good reason for that. That's more of an industrial play as it is an OEM play. So keep that in mind when you're using the trailer, working with the trailer, the customers you want beside the trailer are those customers interested as uh, OEM or panel builders. Back in 2005, we launched the XT family of products. The XT family starts with the manual motor protectors, manual motor starters. We've even got combination motor controllers uh, on a common DIN rail. Matter of fact, we like this product so well, we ended up buying this company. And uh, we start out with their manual push button motor starters. They go up to 25 amps. We've got the rotary types, they go up to 60 amps. This is the combination motor controller on one common rail. We've got a combination motor controller in a reverser setup on a uh, back plate. You'll notice that the jumpers are now done internally. They're not done externally with wires as we had to do in the past. Saves a lot of time at the OEMs. Assembly of these products are done without tools. Disassembly, you'll require some minor tools, but assembly times are cut immensely. We've got uh, 4X type enclosures, or in this case, IP65 type enclosures for both the push button manuals and the rotaries. To continue on with the XT family, we've got a whole series of control products for motors. We've got the mini timers. We've got control relays for the XT family. The mini starter here at five horsepower. We've got the uh, 10 horsepower contactor. This particular one has what we call uh, the uh, quick connects on, spring cage type connectors. They, again, save a lot of time uh, when it comes to assembly and disassembly. Uh, we've got the five horsepower IEC starter. This particular one uh, has our brand new uh, C396 solid state overload. So you can get a solid state overload along with a bimetallic type overload with the XT family. So this is new for 2008. Takes us up to the contactors across the top, uh, various sizes. We've got 25 horsepower right up to the 125 horsepower contactor you're seeing here. And right beneath each one of those, you've got your bimetallic overload, which we call a fixed adjustable. So basically no heaters required, but you can adjust the trip range on each one of these overloads. And basically these three units you're looking at here are basically cabled down to, we would call it the standalone type overload. They're not integrated such as the product uh, that you see here where we integrate it into the contactor. These are remotely mounted. And in some cases, most cases, these are used for people that have uh, capacitor banks. They need to get in between the contactor and the overload. And the way they do this is use a standalone device and with our double lugs that all of our contactors come with, they can wire out to their power factor correction capacitors and they cable down to their overload because power factor correction capacitors must be before the overload or you'll get things like nuisance trips. That takes us to the reversers and we've got some of the XT reversers on the trailer here. Various sizes, as you can see, right up to the 150 amp reversing contactor set you see here. You'll notice that we've done away with those external jumpers. That is a huge time saver for OEMs. You can imagine the amount of time it takes to pull wire off a roll, strip the ends, bend them appropriately, slide them in, and not to mention of the number of errors that can be made by doing that. So by using these common rail plastic or uh, insulated bus bars, they slide into position, reducing your errors and reducing your, your, your time that it takes to put a reverser together. Here you can see the external uh, jumpers here 
On the bottom of this unit here in black, you'll see the uh, jumpers on the bottom of it. That takes us to our 250 amp contactor. Still relatively small when you consider some of the other products out in the field today. But what's really amazing is when you get to the 580 amp contactor. Typically, a 580 amp contactor would fill the corner of this trailer. You're now looking at a uh, 580 amp contactor taking up a fraction of the space that it would have in the past. And what's the secret? Why is it so small? In the 580 amp contactor, we move to vacuum technology. Vacuum technology requires you to only move those power contacts a few millimeters to open and close the contactor. Whereas in the case of the 250 amp unit here, you need a gap of close to an inch to break the 600 volt motor load. In this case, you move it a fraction, a millimeter or so, to, to, get your, uh, to get your break that you need to stop your 600 volt motor. The secret is, there's no arc in a vacuum, and that's how we do it. Takes us to the, uh, what's new for us this year on the trailer in 2008, is we've got the 200 amp four pole contactor. You'll see a lot of these used for lighting loads, four pole contactors. We've got the uh, 80 amp four pole contactor, and we've got the 45 amp four pole contactor. New for us this year. For those folks that use capacitive banks, we've also got uh, capacitive type contactors. What we do with these that's different than a standard contactor is we have integrated resistors and, and early make contacts to quench the amount of arc that's created when you first start to charge a capacitor bank. So we've got various types here. We've got a 65 KVAR and a 25 KVAR contactor from the XT family. And again, what's nice about it is because it's all from one family, the accessories are common across all the different product lines. Now we're going to talk about some other products that Eaton has for control. We've got the what we call definite purpose. Definite purpose contactors are a very economical way to start and stop a motor, start and stop a resistive type heater load. We've got various types on the trailer. We've got single pole, double pole, and the three pole units up to uh, 50 amps. The thing you need to understand about the definite purpose line is that its rating is the maximum amount of energy you could put through that device. Not like some of the old NEMA products where if it was rated for 200 amps, you could probably put 300 amps through it and it wouldn't really care. With the definite purpose line, you're getting a very economical contactor, but you don't exceed its ratings. That takes us to the uh, drive line we have. You'll notice on the trailer, as I mentioned before, we don't have an XVX drive on this trailer because that's more of a, an industrial play. So we've put the drives on here, there's three of them, that our OEM customers are most interested in. Starting out here with the larger unit, the GVX, this is a, uh, a five horsepower unit, uh, comes in various sizes, all the way up to 100 horsepower in its largest frame. We've got the MVX, 600 volt rated drive. Uh, in this particular case, we've taken the display face on and remotely wired it over here to a display. Uh, just to show people that you can remote mount it if you want to have control on the front of your enclosure. Then we go to the little NFX, another good OEM play. This is uh, not a 600 volt drive. Uh, it takes you up to uh, uh, two horsepower in that range. And a lot of customers love this product for doing phase conversions, that kind of thing, where they have a single phase source and they want to transfer that single phase force over to a three phase source. Uh, it's just a, another application for it, but uh, economically priced and priced right for the marketplace. These guys run in about the, uh, the three, $300 range, so very cost efficient when you're talking about a drive. Uh, another product on the trailer that's new for us this year, and we talked a little bit about it up here when we talked about the XT product, the integrated uh, starter that you've seen, is the C396. So we've included three of the 396s here. These are the standalone units, lugs on line side, right? Uh, the other nice thing about this product is you can adjust the trip class. You've got 5, 10, 20, and 30. Uh, as simply as adjusting the dip switches that are on here to get your different trip classes. 
solid state, so there's very minimal heat. You don't have that heat that you would get from a standard bimetallic device because they're based on the amount of current that travels through the bimetallic. That generates a lot of heat. With the C396 line, you're now dealing with a solid state device. You have CTs, and those current transformers take that information into a microprocessor that's on board and translate that into motor current. So uh, much, much less heat. Uh, another benefit of this product, and we don't have an actual one on the trailer here, but uh, you'll see the remote reset. So you can have 120, 24 volt uh, remote reset for that. There's a common paddle that goes over the front of the device that hits the trip lever, and you've got a remote reset. Uh, takes us to the, uh, the ground fault option. We've got the D64 RPB30. This device uses a remote CT with adjustable trips. You can tr adjust the, the trip delay up to 10 seconds. Um, basically, it goes from 30 milliamps all the way up to 9 amps. Some of you may ask why uh, such a long delay on a ground fault. Uh, based on the feedback from the oil patch, uh, Suncor, and they jokingly told us that uh, a good man's good for 10 amps. So, and he's good for 10 amps for uh, a total of 10 seconds. So I don't know if that's true or not, but I know they're always hiring people up there. Uh, that takes us to our power supply line. Unique for us here in Canada is the fact that we have a 600 volt, fully rated, three phase to 24 volt DC power supply. These are made here in Mississauga developed and specced by Eaton, and they give you a full range. Uh, this particular unit here, the PSS-160D, is 160 watt power supply that has capabilities through the column length that you'll see on the front to be linked together to get multiples of that wattage. So if you needed more than 160 watts, you'd buy a second one. You'd connect up a 14 gauge wire between the column lengths. You would double the amount of power that you would have. We've done the same with the 55 watt unit. It too has a comm link. It too is rated at 600 volts. And when I say 600 volts, it's designed to live in our 625, 630 volt world and uh, good for up to 660 volt max. We've got the smaller 25 watt power supply lines. Uh, they're basically very economically priced and perfect for our IT family. That brings us to the uh, next product on the trailer is our IT soft starters. Very unique in the business. Uh, it was released back in uh, 1998. Uh, the, the reason this is a unique product for us is its physical size. It's one of the smallest soft starters you're going to find in the marketplace. What we've done differently is we don't leave our SCRs firing at 100% of the time after you've completed the ramp to start your motor. What we do differently is after the ramp is completed, we pull in a full voltage bypass contactor. And inside the body of both of these soft starters, a matter of fact, all three of these soft starters, is a bypass contactor. You can physically see the bypass contactor on the front of this unit, the 752. On the larger 801 and the 811, it's built inside. These display faces, or DIMMs as we call them, can be remotely mounted. The particular display face on the C811, or sorry, the S811, is uh, a display that can be used to show you voltage, three phase, could show you current three phase, and your kilowatt usage. Uh, very handy to have, not to mention the fact you could use that display face to do all your programming. Program your ramp, if you want to kick start, what kind of soft stop you want. It can all be programmed through the display. For those that like the more traditional analog type soft starter, we've got the S801. Again, the display can be remotely mounted. And in both cases, you could take these displays off so you don't have people tampering with them uh, if, if you wanted security. Uh, and to program the analog device, you've got a series of dip switches. And then you just basically take your screwdriver and adjust the pots on the front to control your kick, your ramp, and your soft stop. On the S, 752, we've got the built-in bypass again uh, with less function. We have ramp only. Uh, basically, you can have a soft stop adjustment and you adjust the settings on this unit via the pots. The FLA, again, with a pot adjustment. 
and uh, anything that may occur as far as a trip will be displayed on the front on the LED display. It'll basically describe what that number is. You'll get a number on the front and there's a, a table there that'll show you exactly what you've tripped out on. So that's the soft start line. Again, these products, all three of these soft starters, 24 volt DC, that's why we developed the power supplies that we needed. Uh, that takes us to the full voltage family and the IT family. The full voltage units basically range all the way up to NEMA size 5. We've got up to NEMA size 4 on the trailer. We start out with the NEMA 0, 1, 2, up to the 4. Very small when you compare to the old analog devices. For instance, this is a NEMA size 4 starter. This is a NEMA size 4 contactor. So you can imagine, this still needs an overload, which will take up that much more space. And we've compacted it all into this one compact unit. Very popular with the industrials. Uh, you'll see a lot of these being used in our motor control centers. For those more traditional type uh, end users, OEMs, we still have the NEMA electromechanical devices. We talked a little bit about this one before, how it compares to the IT, but uh, there's still those customers that have to have electromechanical device and Eaton still offers it. We still go up to uh, NEMA size eight in the Freedom family. The Freedom size four, we've got the, the NEMA size two, or sorry, three, two, and a zero. What we've done new for this year is we've added a solid state overload. We talked about the 396 earlier. We've got a close coupled uh, C396 solid state overload that's available for the Freedom product also. So you can have the C396 on your uh, XT, you can have it on your Freedom, and soon to be uh, for your DP contactors also. Kay. That takes us to our lighting contactor line. We have several different products available for different applications and they suit some more than others. For instance, if you want a mechanical device that's mechanically latched, you would pick the CN30. The CN30 uh, is a ratchet type device, so once you energize it, it locks on, uh, energize it again, it locks off. It's like a ratchet effect inside. And you can turn it on and off by taking both your fingers along the side. You'll see some uh, a spot there where you can use your finger to to push up on it manually and if you want to show your customers. The other nice thing about this product is contractors like it because they could buy a common base and if they get to site and they need more poles, they don't have to decide up front like they would with the Freedom product here how many contacts they need. Here you can build it as you go. I call it a little mini load center for lighting. Basically the way it works is you get double poles, you get two contacts per pole and you can reverse them in the field. So if you get to the site and you find out I need normally closed, it's as simple as taking the contact off, rotating it around the other direction, you've now converted it from normally open to normally closed. It's as simple as that. If you need to add more contacts, you can for a maximum of 12 poles. Takes us to the, uh, the CN35. This is a traditional product we've had for a lot of years a lighting contactor, you decide up front how many poles you need for this, for this particular application. This is an electrically held lighting contactor, so you have to keep the power on it to keep it energized. Works for most cases. A lot of people like this product, but there could be cases where you're in a hospital, a library, or school, where you've got lighting contactors in a box in a suspended ceiling. That's where they're gonna start to specify things like mechanically latched, or in this case, magnetically latched, because there's a lot of hum or noise that could be affecting the area and they want uh, a quiet zone. That takes us to the, the old workhorse we've had for a lot of years. This is a derivative of the Westinghouse A200 product that we still have. What's unique about this guy is when we latch it, we use a permanent magnet to keep it closed. So you're not energizing the coil all day. You won't have that, that coil hum. And basically, once you energize it, if I can get a hold of these underneath here, you basically unlatch the permanent magnet. When you energize it, the permanent magnet holds the uh, lighting contactor closed. Good application. Uh, you're in a big warehouse. You're using high-pressure sodium lights. All of a sudden, the power goes out. 
You'd normally, w with a device like this, you'd have to call someone for maintenance to go into the electrical room and restart the lighting system, and you know how long that takes. Uh, or you could use a device like this for, so when the power does drop off and when the power comes, returns, this device would already be closed and the lights would automatically start their starting cycle again. New for the trailer this year is we're seeing a lot of competition out there that are using the standard XT product, an IEC contactor, for lighting. And we can play that game too now. We've got the four pole XT. And what we've got here is a 27 amp, 600 volt rated four pole lighting contactor in a box with your control. And in this case, we've got start stop and a pilot light. Uh, new for us this year, uh, our friend up in Perth, Eric Posmos, put together a good cut sheet on that. and You're going to see that printed out this year. And it describes how to apply it, what sizes, and gives you list prices on it. So you kind of treat it as an off-the-shelf product. Uh, you may have some distributors that want to take it upon themselves to build their own, and, and they can take it from there. Leading us into uh, disconnect switches, we have various types available. This particular one is a non-fuse. You don't see any fuse holders on this unit. It's a 30 amp non-fuse disconnect switch. We've got a 30 amp disconnect switch. This particular one is good for 50 kA. This one too is 30 amps, but you'll notice it's physically a lot larger. And that's because this unit here is good for 200 kA interrupting. So that's a 200 amp uh, disconnect. Now for those OEMs that are building uh, panels, they have fuse holders. And you can replace those fuse holders with a device we call the, uh, the WMS. And the WMS, this is a single pole, double pole, and a three pole version, replace those little fuse holders with the little glass fuses. So we've got these on the trailer to show the OEMs that they're available. A lot of people will ask, is this thing rated as a circuit breaker? The answer is no. And we have one at the back of the trailer we'll be talking about later called the WMT. That is a, a true circuit breaker, branch circuit protection. This guy here is just nothing more than a fuse holder replacer. And then we've got our thermal breaker line that we all know we're very popular for. And we've got various types. This particular one's thermal, uh, but you could have a motor, HMCP type, magnetic only. Uh, various types of breakers that you would use at the OEMs for the panels. Eaton has a number of options when it comes to push buttons and pilot lights. And uh, what we've done here on the trailer is we've basically broken it down into two sort of groups. I call this the NEMA line. These two rows on, on the left hand side, I call that the NEMA line. On the right hand side I call that the IEC line. So basically we've got the heavy robust metal type of devices that a lot of the automotives, some of the heavy duty uh, industrials demand just because of the number of operations and the type of environments that they're exposed to. Uh, we like, uh, we talk about the uh, IEC type product, uh, you know, it's mostly plastic, although the E22M line it has a metal body to it. So those guys that want the most cost efficient metal type push button assembly, you would use the E22M line. So getting back to the NEMA line or the 10250T line, we've got a number of options. This guy here is a real solution solver for the guy that's got one hole left on the outside of his control panel and he needs to squeeze in a start, stop, and a pilot light. You can do it with one 30 mil hole with this device here as opposed to three individual holes for those three to control devices. If you've got a customer that has used Rockwell for a lot of years or use the Allen Bradley push button line and you're having a problem swaying him over because he just likes the look and feel, he's got inventory, he's always used that product line. We've got the 800 series here, uh, basically looks and feels exactly the same as the Rockwell line but you could buy it from Eaton. Uh, taking us over to the IEC line, again you've got some options when it comes to a solution for one hole with a number of different controls required and maybe a pilot light. Uh, you've got the, we talked about the metal, uh, key type switches, this particular one, by the way, if you're using the trailer and someone has played with this switch, you'll notice that uh, on the back of the trailer, the stack light will stop. So make sure that's always in the on position. Uh, 
and that's pretty much it for the components. Now we'll talk more about the, uh, the assembled push button stations. We've got the general duty type push button stations, very economically priced and most of our distributors stock them on the shelf. Uh, standard configurations, start stop, stop only. We've got e-stop stations on the trailer here. And at the very top, we've got a custom assembly. This is something that Perth can put together for us in the, uh, the ECC, or what we call the Enclosed Control Center in Perth. They'll put together an assembly. In this particular case, this could be used for food processing. They wanted a stainless steel box. They want joystick control. So this could be for a crane or a lift. And they want start-stop for the motor on that crane lift. Over here, we've got a plastic version of it. In this case, he wanted the push button silk screened. And we can do that too. We can arrange to have the, the push button silk screen with arrow buttons, as you see here. Uh, this particular case, they wanted a metal shroud around this uh, selector switch so someone doesn't inadvertently push or rotate this uh, operator. So they put a shroud around it so no one bumps it and shuts it off accidentally. And that's uh, pretty much all the devices we have on the trailer for the OEMs focused on push buttons and pilot lights. Starting out the top of the trailer, you're going to notice our mechanical limit switches. Various types of operators are available. Various types are available. In the uh, particular unit we have here, the, the E50 series, we've actually got a cutaway version so you can see the uh, epoxy loading we have in there, or the potting, the epoxy potting that we did so the, the contacts in that limit switch aren't affected by salt, cutting fluids, moisture, all, that thi all the things that could cause corrosion. And that's available on the E50 series. Then we come down to safety devices. We're seeing more and more of these. And the way these devices work is if you had a particular machine operation, you wanted to make sure people's hands are not within the operating area, you would fix one part of this limit switch to it. The other part, uh, the body, would stay with the device. And when you close that shield, it would then allow the machine to operate. It protects people's fingers, basically. And there's various types of limit switches and so forth available on that line. Comes down to the little mini uh, limit switches. The little mi li limit switches are used for dropping out a contactor when someone opens a door on a panel, turning on a light when someone opens up a door, and there's various types of operators you can get for those. There's heavy duty versions of those that are available for the more industrial grade type applications. We've put a very simplistic uh, control relay on here, the M series. Basically what's nice about this product is you can convert the contacts from normally open to normally closed in the field just by loosening off the screws, pulling the cartridge out, flipping over and sliding it back in. Great industrial grade type of relay. Uh, speaking of industrial grade relays, we've got some other uh, mechanical, electromechanical type relay devices on the trailer. Uh, terminal block mounted types. And we've got the, what we call the ice cube type relays on here. And we've got your basic timers, uh, electromechanical type timers. Uh, but what we're starting to see a trend in the field, and that's what you could talk to your customers about, is as you start to buy more and more of these, um, the price goes up based on installation time, cost of wire, so forth and so on. If you're using more than one timer, one relay, you start to look more towards the integrated product, which we call the Easy Programmable Relay. This particular unit, the first unit here, the EZ512, uh, runs about $150. So you can soon see if you start buying a whole whack of these little timers and the time and effort it takes to wire it in your panel board, and again, opening up areas for mistakes to be made in wiring, sometimes it's more cost efficient to go to the programmable relay type option. And these are programmable relays. You get into the 600 series and up to the 800 series, which is the highest end unit. There's a, on the side, you'll notice there's an opening. That's called the Easy Link. And the Easy Link, you can add more control modules. They look similar to this to expand its, uh, its control capability. So you can go up to 256 I.O. Uh, off the Easy Link relay off the side. Communications also available. Uh, takes us to the terminal block line. Terminal blocks are not that exciting, but the one thing we've learned, OEMs use them a lot. And all OEMs at some point that have electrical or electronic devices have to have terminal blocks. So we've got the standard type that we're used to. 
basically the standard type, you use a screwdriver, strip your wire, you take your wire, you'd have to strip off the end of your wire, slide it inside, and then tighten it down. Now, when you do that, over time, the strands on the end of the wire tend to collapse. And as they collapse, if no one's doing any maintenance on that terminal block and torquing these wires, retorquing the, the terminals, the wire can fall out. So the next invention that they come up with is what we call spring cage terminals. Uh, that, that helped. You still have to strip the wire. But what you basically do is you open up a window. You stick your screwdriver in the middle, open up a window, slide the wire in, lock it into place, and that spring acts as if I was standing here all day long torquing down on that, right? The last but not least, we've got the latest invention, which we call insulation displacement. You don't strip the wire, no need to. You drop it down inside this gauge that acts like your gauge to make sure that you've got the right amount of wire in there. Drop it into the barrel, lock it in, you're done. You've now made your connection. A lot of OEMs are really liking this product. I call this one of the sleepers that you're going to find on the, pro on, the on the trailer. This is one of the sleeper products. So basically what it does is it opens up the insulation on either side of the wire. So you can see how the copper is exposed and the insulation is showing. Saves a lot of time, a lot of effort, and reduces a lot of mistakes. The nice thing about it, it acts the same as the uh, spring cage type where the pressure is maintained on the wire so you're not worried about loose connections down the road. One of the things we can do for your OEM, save him some time, save him some waste, because you can imagine if you built this assembly, how many cardboard boxes would be involved that you have to throw out, not to mention the labor and time and effort of his assembler pulling them all out of a box and mounting them on this rail. Matter of fact, Perth will even do the wiring to these devices if there's some common wiring on this rail. They'll do what's called a custom rail assembly. And that's what you're looking at here, custom rail assembly. We've got our little ELC program, uh, programmable logic controller, our ELC programmable logic controller. And uh, you've got our terminal blocks. There's various types of terminal blocks you can get. We talked about some of those already. This is a, a circuit breaker as opposed to a fusible type terminal which is handy, uh, especially when it comes time to reset it if it ever trips, it just snaps into place. Various types of terminal blocks. There's that WMT I told you about. This particular unit is branch circuit protected and it's good to uh, 240 volts. Uh, my friend Derek Wall tells me sometime in the future uh, we may see a 480 amp version of this. Uh, it gets into the WMS, the type of uh, fuse block replacer and the various types of terminal blocks, relays, uh, fuse uh, relay mounts, or the fusible type uh, terminal blocks, and in this case, a power supply. So that pretty well covers the custom rail assembly on the trailer. Just shows the capabilities we have. Uh, what basically what you do is you fill out a form. It's a one pager. You describe what you want on your rail. Send that to uh, Perth. Perth will do up a estimate or a quote on what it would cost to build that assembly, get back to you and your customer on uh, what it would cost to have that done there. What you'll also find on the trailer for those folks that are looking for sensors, we talked about the limit switches already. We've also got the optical sensors on here. We've got the, uh, the, the 50 series type optical sensor that's in the heavy metal body, great for those heavy industrial type applications. We've got the uh, the various types of optical sensors. This particular one's infrared, shoots out 10 feet. Uh, great for the lumber industry, for those folks that uh, are trying to sense loads at far distances as the, uh, the lumber would go by or rocks or whatever it might be in the assembly line. We've got the uh, 90 degree optical sensors and we've got the various types of opticals here, whether they're 90 degree or remote mount let's say you're in a position where you need the sensing range of a larger bodied optical but you don't have the space you could use this fiber optic uh, extender to get you closer to your application we've got uh, capacitive type uh, uh, sensors for those applications where you're trying to sense non-metallic things like wood paper water 
you could use uh, these devices here to sense levels and tanks and that kind of thing. Uh, we get to the uh, various types of proximity sensors that are available. You can get them in uh, the heavy duty solid potted boxes like you see here. Like we showed on the top of the trailer, this body would all be potted so that you wouldn't have any corrosion inside. Plastic type for any application you might have. A pancake type uh, proximity sensor. Across the bottom, we have the various types of uh, sensors available. What's unique about what we call the uh, IntelliProc, or Intelligent Proximity, as the IProx, is uh, you can really talk a story to your OEMs and really talk to some of the people that stock these proximities, understand how many different types and shapes and sizes there are. On this end of the scale with our global proximity series, you need the particular prox for the type of sensing range you have, your bandwidth, uh, your interference, and with the iProx family, it's programmable. So you can imagine all the different styles you'd have to have for each individual application. Granted, these run about 17 to 20 dollars, and when you get over to this guy here with the uh, the iProx, it may cost you 40, 50 dollars, but you always have the right sensor because what you can do with this product is you basically take your laptop, an RS-232 port, a magnetic puck, and you place it against the side of the uh, face or on the face of the uh, iProx itself. And then let's say you wanted to emulate a Bailiff or a Turk or some of the other competitors. You could go through our, our product ID list, find the actual cat number of the competitor's product, send that file, through the face of this product, program it so that it would operate as the same as our competitor's product. So you always have the right sensor in stock. If you had a custom application where you wanted to custom assemble or custom program the distance of sensing, the bandwidth, and, and all the various parameters, you could do that also. And once you've done that, you could upload that file to it and as an OEM, put their sticker on the side with their cat number and that custom prox now belongs to that OEM, so you can capture that market. So is it worth the extra bucks? Uh, it'll be most definitely worth the extra bucks for those people that have to have, uh, uh, have, to have the right proximity, and they have to have it now. And that's the way to go, because they'll always have the right one in stock, because they can program it. That uh, takes us down to the, uh, what's new on the trailer this year is the uh, current watch sensors. I think this will be the sleeper of 2008. We talked about the, the terminal blocks, the, the insulation displacement type terminal blocks before, but uh, now I think this year we're gonna see a lot of activity from these guys. And basically what they are is they're current sensors. And some of them are automatic, so they'll find the range that your motor's operating within. And if you exceed or go under that, you'll get alarms for it. So basically, uh, you've got that type, you've got the standard relay type output. The relay type output would basically, uh, would once you achieved a certain level of current, the device would operate the output relay and you could have it control your, your assembly line or whatever it is you wanna do. We've also got DC units and the DC units basically will allow you to measure currents for DC which is, again, something unique if you've got uh, a power supply that's based on a DC voltage. We've got the ground fault series. Ground fault, you can measure ground fault with them. Are these ground fault devices for people protection? Not quite, but they do get down to the sensing levels of the five milliamps that's required for people protection, but the device itself cannot interrupt the load. So you would have to have an approved device that's designed for interrupting a load in parallel or working with this uh, before you could use it as a people protection type 5 milliamp ground fault system. And this is just another configuration of the uh, volt trap for the uh, current sensor. So that's what's hot this year. Uh, I think they're priced right for the marketplace and we can work with you guys on that and just the vast array of different applications we can find for this. They're great for uh, people that want to know that they've lost a belt or a chain or a pulley off their motor load, because what happens? As soon as that belt breaks, the current drops. These can sense that current drop, shut down your process because you've blown a belt or chain. Uh, you could also use it for 
uh, logging application where, or any kind of application where you're grinding or chopping something up and the motor current has dramatically increased because it's jammed. And this will sense that, and when it senses it, its output relay would alarm. You could take the process offline so you didn't do any damage to your products. And that's what we have for logic and sensors. On the back of the trailer, uh, we've actually put a working demo of the IT communicating uh, MCC. And what we've done, just for the sake of saving space and saving weight, uh, as you know, with our other trailer, we've got issues with the weight of the trailer. So what we did is we basically just built a wooden box and put uh, a couple of the IT wrappers in here. And what the OEMs like about the back of the trailer is, first of all, you can do a quick overview of the HMI line. And the HMI line, uh, very cost efficient, uh, well, I would say cost efficient panel mate. Uh, we talk about our Panelmate line, something in an 8-inch color like you see here in Panelmate would probably cost you between four and $5,000, where you can get into a touchscreen uh, of an 8-inch style for, you know, around $1,200. So very more, uh, very, very more cost efficient than what we had with the Panelmate, but realizing we've taken away a lot of the features, but the feature sets that are left are the ones that most people would require anyhow. The other thing, uh, just a quick one, uh, we've put on the back of the trailer is our new line card poster. You guys uh, should have uh, this poster at all of our distributors by now. Uh, and that poster basically gives them an overview of all the uh, control products we offer. Uh, good way to, to give them a little 30 minute uh, advertiser or 30 second advertisement for all the products we have. And we put it on the back of the trailer just as more of a reminder. Uh, so we've got the, uh, the ITMCC here with the HMI screen in color. It's uh, communicating. Uh, basically, you can start and stop the uh, contactor from here. Uh, if you wanted to open it up and show the customer the inside of the bucket, that's no problem. Take your screwdriver, open up the door, uh, make sure that you have shut the uh, disconnect to the off position. Remember, the door won't open unless you do that. So don't go prying away at it. Uh, it'll open if it's in the right position. And basically you show them that we've got a NEMA size, we do up to NEMA size two in this bucket, in this wrapper, this size. We've got the HMCP is the disconnect and our uh, electric uh, handle mech, electronic handle mech system that's communicating up to the HMI screen. Now we're doing this via Modbus for this for this particular case and basically we're connected to an RS-232. Down the road these HMIs will grow uh, in functionality. Right now this area in the HMI is blank uh, but down the road they're looking at modules for control so you'll have output relays on here. Uh, you'll also if you wanted a communication module to do TCP IP Ethernet there'll be a communication module that'll plug into there. Um, so that's basically all you would show with the MCC. Uh, more of the uh, industrialized type OEMs would be interested in that, those folks that do use MCCs. Uh, so for the most part, uh, the general OEM person would not be interested in it. So you spend most of your time talking about the HMI. On the back, we've also put what we call the blue mode HMI. It's a little four inch screen. It's running a demo uh, program right now, so you can go through and you can show how this blue mode screen works. It shows you how you're filling and emptying these tanks. Uh, you could use it for multiple application for indicators, when you want to have indicators change state based on an action on a process line. You could have it simulate the old analog meters. In this case, you could have it operating just like the analog meters would through a digital screen. Um, there's different buttons you could have, some more buttons, and then bar graphs, that kind of stuff. What they find impressive about this is that for about three, four hundred dollars, they can get into an HMI screen. So if they've got a panel or a control assembly that uses quite a number of push buttons and pilot lights, this soon can replace it all. Plus, they could do some unique things and program it so that their name comes up at the beginning for their application they have in here so that when customers buy their particular panel, they know that they have to go back to that guy, the guy that's names on the screen for information on how to repair or add on to or change. 
The other thing we've put on the back of the trailer that's powered uh, is our stack light assembly. Uh, basically, uh, this is a 24 volt DC incandescent bulb system, but we all know they come in LED or you get LED clusters. You can get various types of horns. You get a horn or a siren that goes with this. Uh, you can do up to six different colors. And the nice thing about it is it's a toolless ass disassembly and assembly. So you can pull it apart, uh, show them how it goes together, how the rubber seals work. Um, and uh, worst case, if you get a flat tire on the trailer, fire up the generator. You can power this up and it'll keep you safe on the side of the road. I've never had to use it yet. That's pretty much everything we have on the back of the trailer. This side of the trailer's focused on predominantly contractors. So if, you're, if you've got a particular crowd you're meeting with or whatever, you're going to find the electrical, commercial uh, type contractors will conjugate on this side of the trailer because they're looking for more assemblies as opposed to components. And that's the way we set the trailer up. You will find some OEMs that build skids. And then those folks that build skids are looking for disconnect switches or a combination motor controller that they can mount to their skid to do their, their control on their process control system. Um, so we've put both on here. Plus, this is an excellent spot to understand all of the capabilities of our enclosed control center up in Perth. Matter of fact, everything you see on this side minus the disconnect switches uh, are all built in the Perth warehouse, and that's where these were all built and, and designed. Um, so it's all stuff that you can find in our closed control catalog, and it's all stuff that you can get pricing for through Bidman by taking your closed control catalog, take that part number, enter it into Bidman, and get a list price for it. So we talked to our uh, end users, predominantly I spent a lot of time explaining our capabilities up in Perth, and they're all very happy to know that these are all built in Canada. They're not built somewhere else, and then they ship them in, and, and they, they want to know that there's some local support. Not to mention the fact we've got our regional satellites that can also build these, and for those quick turnarounds of quick ships, that's what they're there for. Combination, and why is this a combination? It has a disconnect switch uh, inside it, and it has the IT NEMA size 4 starter. This particular uh, unit, what you can point out to your customers is when you're talking about IT and the 600 volt power supply is you've eliminated the need for the CPT. No need for the, the 600 volt to 120 volt CPT because the power supply handles that. The, uh, the full voltage 600 volts comes into it, you get your 24 volt control out that feeds the IT. Remember IT all works on 24 volt DC. In this particular case uh, he wanted ground fault so we put the D64 RPB30 ground fault relay in here all in a nice package with the 10250T uh, type uh, control. What I like to talk about when we talk about soft starters in a box because of our huge advantage in size is typically a uh, 60 horsepower soft starter in a box or the soft starter itself would be physically the size of this box. This is a non-combo. Of course your disconnect means would be upstream but this is a 60 horsepower soft starter in a box. Typically a soft starter would be the size of this box, but because of our unique advantage with the built-in bypass and our SCRs not being online all the time, we can dramatically shrink the enclosure size and using the 600 volt power supply, there's no need for a CPT, so that helps. And we've got it all down into a nice little package. This guy here is the uh, S752, 40 horsepower, soft starter in a box. Unique, uh, very unique in the fact that our physical size allows us to have smaller enclosures than the competition. And that can be a big advantage when you're laying out a particular control panel. So that's what we have for the uh, soft starters. Uh, we've got uh, the full voltage NEMA size 4 and we'll talk more about the other products as we move down the trailer. One of the other things we've put on the trailer is a uh, soft starter 60 horsepower S801 in a box, similar to the, uh, well down there we had the NEMA size 4 full voltage. Uh, this is a 60 horsepower, but what we've done differently, instead of breaker type, we've gone to fusible type, just to indicate the fact that we can do both. We do both breaker type or fusible type disconnects. Again, you can point out the fact that 
with the power supply being in there, there's no need for CPT uh, to be connected uh, in the circuit, saving space. And uh, we basically have the uh, side mount fan. Uh, and guys, this is a reminder too, uh, any place you see an S801, there better be a side mount fan EMM18 on the side. Um, and that's something that we have to diligently keep reminding our assembly folks that don't forget that fan. I know in Perth now, when you try to order an S801 as a loose component, it always comes with the fan. So we just have to make sure that any place you may see an S801 in the field, make sure the side mount up uh, cooling fan is on there. What it does is it extends the life of the product. The product won't fail uh, immediately, but what it does do is extends the life into the you know, the five to 10 year range as opposed to the two and three year range without it, all right? So that's the uh, 60 horse combination, fusible in a box on the trailer. New for uh, 2008 is the uh, reversing CMC we've got on the trailer here. This is a 10 horsepower uh, combination motor controller. We had one on the trailer last year. It was much larger. It was almost the size of these two boxes. Uh, what we've had done in, uh, up in our Perth uh, ECC center is we had the folks take a look at the design, work with CSA, and they physically have dramatically reduced the physical size of the box. So this is a 10 horsepower combination motor controller with reverser XT in a box. And uh, we've got uh, various types of the uh, display and control on the front. Up at the top here, we've got the traditional 25 horsepower XT with handoff auto and pilot light. Plug and play, as we all know, plug and play has the connector plugs that are designed within the kits and we build the kits up in the Perth mod shop. And basically what they do is they take those kits, put keyed plugs on the end and those keyed plugs will only allow someone to connect it into its proper mated plug therefore sa saving time, effort, and trouble uh, when it comes to a contractor going to site to start up his compressor, fan, or whatever it is he needs to start. He doesn't want to waste time wiring and using his wire. And that's another thing you talk about. Everyone knows the cost of copper wire these days. With the plug and play, it's going to come with all the kits, with all the wiring there. So as far as fixed costs go for that contractor, he could buy the plug and play today, buy it tomorrow, Odds are the price isn't going to change by day like the copper wire does. It'll probably change per year or whatever, whenever uh, Eaton does another price adjustment. So that's the 25 horsepower with the C400 type controller kit. New for 2008, we've put one on the trailer. We've taken the plug and play, which was limited to 25 horsepower. We've extended it to 40 horsepower. And we've also allowed for the traditional type control. For those folks that must have, you know, standard pilot light and selector switch control, and they're just used to it, it's available. We're gonna keep the C400 also, but this is also available as an option. So you can, you can see you get a lot more versatility in what color light lenses you would get and the type of selector switches you could get based on the plug and play 40 horse with the, uh, the E22 control kits. A little bit of work to do when you plug it in, of course, not as convenient as the C400 because you have to plug in one of the control plugs and you have to snap the auxiliary relay or auxiliary uh, contact onto the side of the XT uh, starter. But other than that, uh, it's a good option for those folks that have to have the traditional push button assemblies. Back of the trailer here, we've got the uh, a four pole lighting contactor in a box. This is the CN35. Standard C400 control kit. Uh, we would put that together in the Perth warehouse. This is something that's pretty simplistic. Could be done at a distributor's uh, site if he so chooses to, to do something like that. Um, he may provide all the loose components for an end contractor or a panel builder to put together himself also. So that's a 20 amp four pole lighting contactor in a box. Last but not least, as far as the non-combos go, we've got the non-combo 20 horsepower XT starter in a box. Again, the C400 type control kit. This is basically something that a distributor could have on a shelf 
and the customer would do all his own wiring or the client would do all his own wiring to it. Um, so those are available. Uh, this is a 20 horsepower XT. Uh, takes us to the disconnect switches. In the back of the trailer, uh, we've also seen a need for those folks that are using electrical control devices like this to have disconnects because disconnects are important for isolation, for safety, for when people work on these products. So we've got the, uh, the 30 amp stainless steel safety switch here. Uh, what's nice about this guy is it comes with the optional see-through window. So not only do you get the visual effect uh, that you've moved to the off position, you can visually confirm it through the window that the knives on the switch are open. Big convenience, a lot of customers are actually specifying that these days. Uh, all stainless steel construction, fusible fuse holders are inside, uh, fuses supplied by others. Uh, that takes us to the, uh, the smaller rotary type uh, switches at the bottom here. And you see a lot of the stainless steel. This is a uh, 30 amp 4X disconnect in a box, non-fusible. And you see a lot of this for the food processing industry. They want to use stainless steel boxes. These boxes are also, for both these switches, are available in painted versions also. But uh, this particular one's stainless. We've got the farming community, uh, some of the agriculture community when it comes to greenhouses, stuff like that. A lot of them are moving over to the plastic design. This is a 30 amp non-fused plastic switch. Uh, very more robust than you would expect uh, from plastic. And a lot of the industry like it because it doesn't rust, no corrosion. Uh, that's why they like the plastic assemblies. So basically 30 amp non-fused, 30 amp non-fused and stainless, and a 30 amp safety switch in a 4X enclosure. That's what we've got for disconnects on the trailer. On the back of the trailer, we've got the uh, XT products. You'll notice pretty much from the last pillar back, everything is XT. Uh, there's a lot of customers, uh, especially when you're talking contractors and, and some of the OEMs that are really pushing this IEC drive, uh, just because of the fact that the products are more robust than they used to be in the past when you got an IEC product. They're beginning to approach the durability of a NEMA product. So people are saying, hey, for the cost savings, I'm okay with IEC. So we've put a lot of IEC assemblies on the trailer just for that reason. Uh, this is a combination 125 horsepower rotary type disconnect using an HMCP breaker. And uh, basically we're gonna use a breaker type disconnect. We've got the 125 horse XT starter. This has the integral overload, the X TOB type overload, the bimetallic overload, adjustable fixed. So if anybody wants to have a look at what that looks like, because on the other side of the trailer, we only have it in a standalone version. Here we've got the integrated version with the three copper tabs that slide up inside the uh, contactor itself. Control transformer is there, and basically uh, 10250T type uh, control. Up here we've got the uh, 40 horsepower. This is something you don't see a lot of anymore because people are moving more towards the, uh, the soft start line. This is a Y-Delta starter. Y-Delta with XT. And basically you've got your, your Y-Point and your Y-Delta contactors with overloads for your starters. This is a non-combo unit. And how do you know that? You'll see no disconnect switch, either fusible or breaker type. The, disconnects, the disconnect means is upstream, right? So it'll be a disconnect, fusible, or breaker type upstream somewhere. Y delta, there's the acceleration timer that's in there. And basically the way they work is you start off 347 volts. After the five second interval or whatever the uh, acceleration time is you've selected, it switches over to delta, which is 600 volts. So you inset, uh, initially get a reduced voltage start from that configuration. But like I said, a lot of people are moving more towards a soft starter for those types of applications. We've got a stainless steel 60 horsepower reverser in a box. Again, you'll notice no disconnect. Therefore, it's a non-combo and your disconnect's upstream somewhere to protect this device. And one thing I'd like to point out with all of these devices that you'll see in the trailer, we've got the CSA label on here. This is something that CSA is really 
pegging down on these days is the fact that there's a lot of shops out there that aren't doing their due diligence when it comes to combination testing. So what we've done is we'll spell it out and you'll see it on all the nameplates on the back of these assemblies. You'll open up the door, you'll see this is suitable for 100 KA RMS symmetrical at 600 volts when used with a 100 amp J-type fuse. You have to spell that out now. That's not something you could just assume. And that's where a lot of these uh, general contractors slash panel builders are getting into trouble these days and they're actually coming to us ask, asking us Lauren could you put together a base unit no control I basically need this rating nameplate and then what they would do is add their timers and add their control to our base unit so you may find customers like that out there that have been uh, in trouble with CSA and basically are looking for someone to build the base, uh, base uh, assembly so that uh, they could do all their own additional control inside the box. So CSA labels, pay attention to the uh, interrupt ratings. Very important, CSA are demanding that we spell it out now. Okay, as far as hookup goes for the trailer, I'm not gonna break into all those details because I'm not leaving the trailer with sales to run with. There's only one gentleman in the West and I trust him and I'll be talking to him anyhow to make sure he's confident and he knows what he's doing hooking up this trailer. Uh, but what one of the things we will have to cover is just the basic setup when you get to site. Uh, basically the sides are all pneumatic. You unlock them. Remember it's always turn left to unlock, right to lock on all those locks that are on the outside of the trailer. That'll take you a little bit of time. It takes approximately uh, 15 minutes, uh, you can get that down even to a, a lesser time as you improve with your knowledge of the trailer. But about 15 minutes to a half an hour you should allow for your call. Uh, but basically it consists of unlocking all those locks, flipping the sides up. You'll notice you'll have the little bars with the uh, interlock keys. They're used to hold open the signage that's on the, the top half of the doors. Uh, very simple to use. Uh, don't need a lot of explanation for that. But one of the things I want to quickly cover is the generator itself. The generator is only used to power up the MCC and the stack light at the back of the trailer. I've also got a battery charger in here. If you're going to run the port lights that are above all the products on the sides, be aware that you're running on the battery that's in the trailer. It has a good life, but you're not going to be able to run it for more than uh, two hours, let's say three hours at a time without wearing down the battery. That's why I put a battery charger in here that'll run off the generator when we uh, pull it out. So we'll just go a quick overview how that looks. This is the generator. Uh, you'll find it in the trailer. There's two uh, support methods to keep it in place. There's this one on the front. You basically, all you gotta do is basically uh, unhook it from the hole that's in the side. That allows it to roll out into the aisleway. And as far as the generator itself goes, you'll find a, uh, a, another strap across the top of it. This is the most important strap, and you should wrap it around each of the bars or handles on the top of the generator to keep it from moving forward and backwards during transportation. You'll find a hook in the floor that it mates up to. You just disconnect that, take your uh, straps off. The other thing we've done with this trailer and uh, generator is we've mounted this generator on wheels. So it's very easy to move. You don't have to stress and lift and lug. Basically all you need to do is to roll it out into the aisleway and slide it forward. Bring it all the way to the front of the trailer so that the exhaust is exposed to the outside of the trailer. Leave the door open. Now for starting, before we get to that point, Turn the generator sideways. There's a couple steps you have to take before you start. Basically, you have to remember during transportation or anytime you're moving this generator to leave this switch in the off position. That turns on and off the fuel. Very critical when you're transporting it that this be in the off position. You don't want the fuel washing the engine block or putting oil or gasoline down in your oil so you always make sure that's shut off. The other part of the generator you need to know about when you first start it, usually the early morning starts when it's cold, is pull open the choke. 
right? There's your choke handle. And then the only other thing you have to remember, again, you have to have the, the fuel switch on, choke out, your on off acts as your ignition like in your car. So you turn the switch on. There's a circuit breaker on here for AC current and one for DC current. You will not use the DC, so don't concern yourself with it. And basically at this point, your fuel's on, your choke's on, your ignition's on, you're ready to start. Takes this handle, give it a good pull, and you're ready to go. Generator's now running. Turn on your AC power. And the next step is to turn the generator around, put it into its position, go and get the uh, cables you're going to require to plug in here. You start out with approximately two rolls of the flexible cable. This has the twist lock on the end, which will mate up with the plug on the side of the trailer. We'll leave that there for now. The other plug you require, usually you only need about one loop of this, is your standard duplex receptacle. You plug that into the generator. Once that's done, the generator is running, you're good to go. The only thing left to do is plug it into the side of the trailer. Take this plug and plug it in the side. Okay, last thing you need to do is connect up your twist lock 120. You'll find on the left side of the trailer or the driver's side of the vehicle, if you walk to the back, at the front of the trailer, you will find this plug. You just basically pop open the cover. It's just press fit. And you basically look at the keys that are on here. One of them's ground, has an extra tab, and it looks kind of like a hockey stick. And you plug it in, give it a turn to the uh, right. Right to lock, left to unlock. Very similar to the way the locks work in the trailer. Everything is, is left on lock and right to lock. Okay? And power it up. The fuel that's in the generator will last approximately eight hours full-time use. Most of our demonstrations last no more than an hour. And that'll allow you several days worth of fuel on one fill-up. If you need extra fuel, the generator's out of fuel. You'll find a five-gallon can in the back of the truck. Open it up. Fill up the generator and you're good to go again. And that concludes the tour of the trailer.